to being here today. So as I mentioned last night, the culture wars have wreaked enormous havoc on our contemporary common life while sullying Christian witness. American Christians too easily recapitulate the worst characteristics of the cultural right and the cultural left. On the right, they are tempted to prize their own comfort and security over the well-being of others. They are tempted to portray themselves in a flattering light, as hardworking, virtuous, and entitled to good things, while depicting people who are different from them as lazy, morally reprobate, and undeserving. They are tempted to lash out in fear against those whom they perceive as a threat, and to see access to resources as a zero-sum game. And perhaps most alarmingly, they are tempted to enshrine their own demographic group as God's favorite people. On the other side of the divide, progressive Christians sometimes fall prey to their own brand of narrow narrowness and cultural recapitulation. Their therapeutic versions of Christianity can idolize self-expression and view shamelessness as the cardinal virtue. They often fail to offer transcendent reasoning or motivation for social justice. Without such moorings, they are prone to latch onto causes that other progressives have deemed important, often momentarily before moving on to the next trend, and then use these causes as a platform to signal their own virtue rather than as a path toward transformation. As I argued last night, both sides of the culture wars fall prey to a de facto secularism. The contemporary culture wars, while ostensibly fueled by religious and ideological reasoning, are to a greater extent powered by identity markers such as ethnicity, class, religious affiliation, and political party. In the culture wars, religion is used as a means to an end rather than speaking on its own terms. Missiologist David Bosch, while examining the call of the church to participate in God's mission of redemption and reconciliation in the world, identifies two types of temptations to which the church can easily fall prey. The first he calls the secularist temptation, in which the church embraces the values of the world and baptizes them with religion. Conservative attempts to recreate a mythic past or realize a utopian future while seemingly driven by Christian spirituality, are actually expressions of the logic of empire. A Christian vision of cultural engagement that seeks to control or dominate others is a vision rooted in idolatry. The church, or the Christian worldview, or the Judeo-Christian heritage becomes an idol, and the spirit of God is denying any activity in the world outside of what the Christians are doing. The church sees itself as exclusively containing and even controlling God. This was the logic of Christendom, which confined the work of God to a particular territory and a particular group, and which married the church to political power. As the history of Western colonialism in the modern period illustrates, the logic of Christendom led to exploitation of people, land, and resources on an unprecedented scale. Christian mission maintained a complicated relationship with colonialism, with missionaries supporting imperial projects in some ways and undermining them in others. To the extent that European and American missionaries stood in solidarity with local people in colonized territories, however, they often did so from the margins rather than from the centers of political power. Prosperity theology, sometimes called the gospel of health and wealth, is another embodiment of the secularist temptation. While adherents of prosperity theology embrace a worldview that is highly supernatural, even magical, on one hand, the telos of their theology is the same as market capitalism for humans to be successful. Thus, even though prosperity-minded American Christians view God's action in the world in an almost transactional way, they end up looking similar to other Americans who are captivated by the promise of material comfort. Christianity becomes a product to be bought and sold with the invisible hand of the market as the supreme deity. Left-leaning embodiments of the secularist temptation 
are perhaps more obviously secular. One version of this can be found among pro progressive Christians is de facto humanism, which essentially disregards the agency of God and relies on human effort to the neglect of prayer. Another version is to see the hand of God as the architect of all progressive causes, therein forfeiting any pro prophetic distance from cultural norms. With the social movement enshrined as ultimate, progressive Christians can overly identify with human capacity or ignore their own fallibility. Progressive Christians can fall prey to the seculars' temptations by getting on the bandwagon of social justice causes while losing a connection to the underlying reason to care about such causes in the first place. Progressive Christians sometimes slip into self-righteousness or an all-or-nothing thinking, fashioning themselves as social justice crusaders. In this mindset, the truth is often conceived as either or rather than both and, and people are divided into categories of us and them. Being perceived as an advocate for justice becomes an end in itself, rather than justice being the ultimate end. Social justice causes function as the stage for one's own virtue performance. In their capitulation to the norms of empire, whether in acquiescing to the status quo or in attempting to supplant the status quo with an alternative empire, Christians on the left and on the right who fall prey to the secularist temptation end up preoccupied with power struggle. Whether lured by nostalgic views of the past or utopian visions of the future, they easily prioritize their own success. Not only do the culture wars bring out the worst, and many who wage them while failing to bring about positive change in society, they also further alienate people whose marginalized status all but ensures that gaining power over others will not be a successful strategy. As I argued last night, the culture wars do not function as enlightened discourse on the common good for all stakeholders. Instead, they are ugly, po ugly power contests. As, described, as a descriptive category for naming what is going on in the American cultural, political, and religious landscape, culture war theorizing has not lost its relevance or utility. But as a metaphor for Christian cultural engagement, it's high time for the culture war rhetoric to be retired. The culture war paradigm is a dysfunctional strategy for faithful Christian engagement. Christians need to recover a vision for society that moves beyond a fixation on the mundane to transcendent meaning, beyond self-interest to the common good, and beyond Christianity as a belief system, moral code, or constituency to Christianity as a path of transformative love. Last night, I discussed Charles Taylor's argument that modernity, even Western Christianity itself, led us to a disenchanted public space circumscribed by the imminent frame. Taylor maintains that this cultural space pushes all of us, whether religious or not, to account for our world outside of religious reasoning. But Taylor also identifies the hallowness of such a world. The imminent frame has no satisfying way of producing meaning, accounting for suffering, or protecting the well-being of all. It leaves us with a bewildering contest of narratives and wills. Realizing that fighting in the culture wars requires an unholy quest for dominance, or at least acknowledging that achieving such dominance is unrealistic, some Christians have advocated for a retreat from the public square. Various versions of this approach to culture have appeared throughout church history, seen in some iterations of monasticism, pietism, anabaptism, and Pentecostalism. In the late 1980s, Stanley Hauerwas and William Willimon published a popular call to separatism with their book, Resident Aliens. Hauerwas and Willimon's central thesis is that the church, as those called out by God, embodies a social alternative to the world that the world cannot know on its own terms. Instead of accommodating itself to the political concerns of the state, the church is called to be a people who see and follow Jesus. Christians are thus resident aliens in the culture in which they live. More recently, conservative writer Rod Dreyer made waves with his book, The Benedict Option. Dreyer argues that Christians should accept the fact that they have lost the culture wars 
and focus on building robust communities of Christian formation and fellowship. According to Dreyer, the Benedict Option allows Christians to resist the American empire and what it represents by opting out of political power brokering and instead attending to a local Christian cultural renewal. While Dreyer's call to separatism at least acknowledges the problematic nature of the culture wars, the Benedict Option is troubling on several scores. First of all, like many Jeremiahs against the decline of Western civilization, the book unselfconsciously focuses on the experiences of white men. As Daniel Jose Camacho writes in The Christian Century, as long as people of color, queer people, and women remain an afterthought in these debates about modernity, our lives and deaths will not matter even as the fate of the world is discussed. Not only does Drea Grandma glamorize America's more Christian past, glossing over slavery and a host of other social sins, he paints the successes of the feminist movement and the gay rights movement as preeminent signs of decline in contemporary American society. Dreyer displays a selective reading of history, as well as a fundamental lack of empathy towards others outside of his social group. Alan Levinovitz calls Dreyer's vision spiritual pornography, and its assumption that people who do not share Dreyer's worldview are evil. The Benedict Option is troublesome both in its assessment of the past and its prescription for the future. Dreyer's call to shore up separatist Christian enclaves is another form of empire building. Even if in circumscribed territory, the call to protect and preserve what is ostensibly in danger of being lost is also a call to protect power relations. Additionally, a focus on self-preservation turns too much attention inward, failing to appreciate that the church exists for the sake of the world. Focusing on self-preservation is a sign of what Eliezer Fernandez calls goal display. The church forgets its reason for being and instead becomes preoccupied with itself. When survival is paramount, says Donald Messer, John Wesley's famous victim, the world is our parish, becomes the parish is our world. David Bosch calls this strategy of withdrawing from public life altogether in the name of purity or piety the otherworldly temptation. Whereas Dreyer, Harawas, Willimon and others correctly identify a propensity for Christians who seek political power to lose sight of their prophetic calling, the separatist strategy tends toward dualism. Life is divided into sacred and secular activities, and salvation is reduced to an individual's fate after death. The separatist strategy fails to acknowledge that God is always and everywhere at work, both in the church and in the world. Additionally, the opt-out orientation is often linked to unexamined privilege or thorough disenfranchisement. For the privileged who have never experienced a personal need for a social safety net, who have never been terrorized by state-sponsored violence, or who have never stood on trial in a justice system that is biased against them, opting out of politics pulls no skin off their backs. On the other hand, those so marginalized by society's political and social structures that they experience little sense of personal agency can turn to otherworldly orientation out of a feeling of hopelessness or desperation. If staking out political territory and conversely retreating from the public square are both problematic strategies for Christian cultural engagement, where does that leave us? To shine a light on the way forward, I turn to a metaphor that Jesus invoked throughout his ministry, the basileia, or domain, of God's love and justice. The metaphor of the basileia of God is a theological treasure trove for helping us move beyond the tyranny of the imminent frame, the carnage of the culture wars, and the irrelevance of cultural retreat. By referencing the basileia of God, Jesus pointed to what Desmond Tutu calls God's dream for human societies. Jesus also used this metaphor to demonstrate patterns of faithful responses to God's vision of justice, healing, and the flourishing of all creation. The term basileia from the Greek New Testament 
is often rendered in English as kingdom of God or reign of God. Though these translations have problematic hierarchical, gender, territorial, and imperial connotations that are not warranted by the New Testament witness. Sensitive to these misleading connotations, other theologians have translated Basileia as kingdom or commonwealth, noting that the Basileia is marked by social harmony, mutuality, and inclusion. For Martin Luther King Jr., the Basileia finds expression in the beloved community, a term coined by Josiah Royce to cast a vision of a society governed by agape love. In the Synoptic Gospels, the Basileia of God is a central theme, especially in the teachings of Jesus. The term occurs more than a hundred times in the New Testament, mostly in parables told by Jesus to his followers. As Jesus depicted the Basileia of God, he painted a vivid picture of the domain of God's rule of love, peace, and justice that will be fully realized in the future, but is also in the process of inbreaking into the present. Some refer to this as the now and not yet dimensions of the Basileia. In the Gospel's depiction, the Basileia of God signifies God's intervention in human history. The Basileia of God is at hand. It is right under our noses, yet impossible to hold within our clutches. The Basileia is not something that we can achieve or build, but rather something that we receive as a gift and enter into by taking on the demeanor of a child and having faith, even as small as a mustard seed. The domain of God's love is radically different from the empires of this world. Liberation theologians have pointed out that Jesus' depiction of the Basileia of God was a deliberate, if indirect, criticism of the Roman system of domination. For Jesus, the Basileia of God includes and even honors the poor, the outcasts, the sick, and the persecuted. This is a dominion unlike any other. It is a realm of radical action. Demonstrate, Jesus demonstrates what it means to welcome, to forgive, to heal, to make peace, and to live joyfully in God's presence. The realm of God's love and justice remains when all other regimes have passed away. In contemporary Western context, religion is often considered to be a private affair. Its supposed value, if any, is in the therapeutic benefits it offers to adherents, not in any theoethical architecture it might offer on a systemic level. In the public realm, we are governed by facts, direct dictated by empiricism, whereas religion may offer values that are acceptable in as much as they are impotent. But even within this allegedly secular context, there is no ethically or philosophically neutral territory. The pursuit of profit, the quest for power over others, and the appetite for personal fulfillment at any cost tend to carry the day. These public values are worshipped in an empire where the powerful set the agenda. The Basileia of God stands in stark opposition to the ethic of pragmatism and the economy of winners and losers. In the Basileia of God, the accumulation of wealth is replaced with a concern for the well-being of those at the margin of society. In this sense, the Basileia of God is a subversive threat to the status quo. Post-colonial and post-modern theorists have argued convincingly for a suspicion of all meta-narratives. Universalizing claims are revealed to be nothing more than a will to power. Thus, any call for Christians to orient their lives around the domain of God's love and justice must be wary of devolving into majority rule morality. In the moral economy of the Basileia of God, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, and the greatest among them are the ones who serve others. It is only through this upending of power structures that the Basileia of God can hope to be anything other than imperialistic. The Basileia of God is a direct repudiation of the drive for power over others and the pursuit of one's own interest over at others' expense. The Basileia of God is specifically yet not exclusively Christian. The ethical economy of the Basileia of God does not point to Christians as the winners and all others as the losers. Various theologians of religion have noted that while the world's religious traditions stand at odds in their beliefs about transcendent reality and their notions 
that how transcendent reality can be known, they are largely united at the level of ethics. The Abrahamic religions all share a commitment that the world belongs to God, whose rule is ubiquitous. Moreover, most religious traditions of the world share a commitment to self-transcendence, peace-building, compassion, and justice. Embracing this shared ethical, spiritual orientation, adherents of various traditions alongside people of goodwill who claim no religious affiliation can stand united in the pursuit of universal flourishing and against the pillage of the earth, the oppression of the poor, and the demonization of fellow human beings. Acknowledging that the basileia of God originates with God helps us avoid pitfalls of over-identifying or under-identifying the work of repairing the world with human efforts. On one hand, we can be tempted to view the basileia of God as something we achieve through our enlightened attitudes and some elbow grease. This can lead to triumphalism, self-righteousness, and judgmentalism. With this conception, we buy into the idea that we are the answer to the world's problems and that God is lucky to have us on the right side. On the other hand, we can be tempted to lead the work of redemption and renewal, justice and peace building to God, washing our hands of responsibility. With false humility and unacknowledged privilege on one side of the social spectrum or resignation to a sense of powerlessness on the other, we end up embracing fatalism and endorsing an unjust social order. Instead of envisioning the basileia as a thing to accomplish or passively behold, we are invited to see the basileia as Jesus depicts it, a gift we receive and a realm we enter. Just as Jesus was oriented to the basileia of God, so too the mission of the church is to participate in and proclaim the basileia of God. Christians never possess or control the basileia, but rather stand under its scrutiny. We respond to God's invitation to join the work that God is doing, recognizing that even though our motives are seldom pure and our efforts are seldom enough, we are still called to pray for the Basileia to come and to participate in that prayer with our actions. If strategies of cultural war promote over-identification with the logic of empire and strategies of cultural retreat promote under-identification with the Christian call to public witness, Cultural engagement oriented around the basileia of God promotes both a critical posture towards society's norms and positive participation in the life of society. The basileia of God invites us both to stand against oppression and to work for justice and peace. Rather than delineating sacred and secular spaces, the good news of God's basileia is as broad as human life. The blind see, the lame walk, the captives are free and the sinners are forgiven. A vision of cultural engagement oriented around the basileia of God is big enough to incorporate various Christian traditions. Along the lines of a liberationist vision, those who love the basileia of God are invited to live in solidarity with the poor and the oppressed. Along the lines of a reformed vision, they are invited to engage in the work of cultural creation and the arts and sciences. Along the lines of an Anabaptist vision, they are invited to participate in acts of hospitality, service, and compassion in their communities and beyond. Coalescing with aspects of all three of these traditions, a public witness around the Basileia hinges on individual and corporate Christian practices. At attempting to avoid pitfalls of prevailing approaches to religion in the modern period, as I mentioned last night, Charles Taylor steers Christians away from a focus on dogmatic metaphysics and toward a focus on radical agape love. Taylor reorients the Christian faith around what he calls the practical primacy of life. Seeing human life in terms of practices, Taylor maintains that our relationship to the world is not primarily theoretical, but rather one of involvement and concern. Our loves exercise greater power than our ideas. We are drawn to communion with God, not by following rules or believing propositions, but rather through transformative experiences of value and beauty. Christianity, thus, is a way of being in the world that embodies an experience of divine love. Christianity, says Taylor, speaks to our longing for fullness by directing us to the wellspring of God's love, 
and inviting us to share out of the abundance that we have received. All Christians are called to receive and enter the Basileia, but what that looks like on the ground depends on our context and social location within that context. Speaking as a white, middle-class Christian woman who finds herself as a member of a society representing the most powerful nation on the planet, yet pervaded by injustice and wrapped by division, I reflect on how the notion of God's love provides a vision for alternative engagement in the culture wars. I set before us two Christian practices that, among others, I think are sorely needed. These practices present not a comprehensive cure to the culture wars, nor a substitute for political in engagement, but patterns of faithfulness oriented to justice and healing. The first practice is multi-pronged. It is the linked activities of lamentation and repentance. To lament is to express grief, sorrow, and even rage over what is lost and broken. To, rep to repent is to express regret, remorse, and responsibility for what is lost and broken. Lamentation and repentance are both holy avenues for responding to personal and social sin. Here I concentrate on the social dimensions. In the contemporary culture climate of finger pointing, group categorizing, and scapegoating, we do not lack for awareness of social brokenness. We know that our social anatomy, anatomy is widely divergent from the Basileia of God, but we lack awareness to the root causes of our brokenness, and we lack a shared vision or plan for mending what is broken. The Lord's Prayer is a guide for Christian practices of lamentation and repentance. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray for forgiveness from our sin, and we acknowledge the need to forgive those who have sinned against us. Too often, we focus on the call to forget, to confession and forgiveness in this prayer, but not on the state of being sinned against. The Lord's Prayer calls us not just to acknowledge the wrongs that we have done, but also that we have been wronged. The Lord's Prayer then speaks to the ecology of sin. In various ways, all of us have both been wronged and have wronged others. But in a social sense, this ecology is more lopsided, with those rich in power being more likely to wrong others than those lacking in power. Taking the Lord's Prayer seriously entails creating spaces for both repentance and for naming and redressing wrongs. In his book, The Wounded Heart of God, theologian Andrew Sung Park helps elucidate the ecology of sin with the Korean concept of Han. Defying easy definitions, Han refers to the profound and complex experience of being sinned against. Park describes Han as a deep wounding of the heart, a frustrated hope, and a shame and bitterness felt by the victims of injustice and oppression. Christians too easily address sin by focusing on the experience of the sinner. Our liturgies do not often ask us to make amends with those we have wronged, nor do they give us an opportunity to express or seek healing in the experience of being wronged. Park argues that if reconciliation with God and with other humans is to take place, not only must sin be repented of and guilt forgiven, but the Han of those who have been wronged must be healed. The experience of Han is a violation of humanity, so it is not easily repaired. Yet, the Gospel gives us hope. The process requires self-reflection on both the part of the wounded and those bearing responsibility for the wound. The Han written, says Park, must awaken to the reality of their own Han, defying the human tendency to deny or deflect one's own woundedness. The process always also requires of sinners and those who profit from other sins of self-critical reflection on their complicity in the suffering of others. Generative self-reflection on social sin is marked by a number of uncomfortable emotions. Rage, powerlessness, shame. Rage is a natural response to being wronged, a consequence of the experience of violation. As the poets and prophets of the Hebrew Bible illustrate, raging well is a holy act. The Book of Lamentations, for instance, profiles the voices of sufferers left behind in Jerusalem 
after the Babylonians destroyed much of the city and took into exile its citizens who would be most useful to them. Those who remained in the city, struggling to survive, were women, children, the elderly, and other marginalized people. As theologian Soon Cha Ra points out, there is a dirge-like quality to the lamentations of the survivors, a mood appropriate for the funeral of the city. The sufferers in lamentation name their pain and their sense of betrayal. They cry out to God for healing and deliverance. Similarly, in order to work toward healing in our society, Christians need to create spaces for holy rage. We need places for those who have been wronged to name their pain, claim it as their own, and call for change. The voices of pawn sufferers who are brave enough to identify with and articulate their pain should be honored and amplified in Christian communities. Whether or not Christians in the community have suffered Han in the same way, they are called to bear with Han sufferers by valuing their agency, seeking out their wisdom, and respecting their varied responses to suffering. Members of the dominant culture like me are called to name and claim our own complicity in social sin and our enslavement to hate and privilege. Instead of taking solace or absolving our guilt with triumphalist efforts to fix the problem and develop communities that have been damaged by the isms of oppression, we are called to listen carefully, to take responsibility for how we have, how we have contributed to the problem, to receive forgiveness, and to act differently. Repentance, the other side of the point of lamentation, is an imperative for all who follow in the way of Jesus. John the Baptist's central message, preparing the way for Jesus, was a call to repent. Jesus repeated this injunction on numerous occasions throughout the Gospels. In order for, the God, in order for God's basileia to be revealed, we must let go of our competing agendas. The call to repentance is a call to recognize and turn away from sins of omission and commission, but it is also a call to recognize how we participate in and benefit from systems that injure others. Even if these systems of oppression were not our idea or creation, we who perpetuate them bear responsibility to acknowledge their legacy. In a cultural climate held hostage by the imminent frame, it is easy to discount the value of prayer in addressing social injustice. Some Christians use prayer as an excuse for avoiding social action, rationalizing their avoidance with claims that God is in control, or only God can change hearts and minds. However, when we approach prayer not as a tool to absolve ourselves from responsible action, but rather as a means of aligning ourselves with God's dream, prayer is a powerful practice. Prayer gives us the space to be brutally honest about the ways we have been harmed and the ways we have harmed others. It situates our sin and our pain in the context of transcendent power. In prayer, we trust that God is strong enough to bear with us in our sin, kind enough to offer us comfort and forgiveness, and wise enough to point us to new ways of living. Prayer is an act of responsibility and of hope. In an environment in which proliferating mass shootings have been met with political and inaction and deflective responsibility, the phrase, thoughts and prayers, has become something of a parody of itself. Progressives call, call foul when conservatives express condolences to the loved ones and victims by promising their thoughts and prayers. Seeing these words, seeing these words as a hallowed cover for defending existing legislation on guns. While using prayer as a shield for bad behavior is indeed reprehensible, prayer itself is not the problem. The Christian practice of repentance is both prayer and action. In the practice of repentance, we name our sins and turn away from them. Within the imminent frame, we are good at calling others to account and offering perceived solutions to social problems, but the imminent frame provides few resources for helping us recognize our own complicity and our woundedness and for moving toward restitution and restoration. As we lament and repent, we pray and we act. We recognize that we need God's help out of the mess we have created, and we also recognize that we are called to join God in God's work. As theologian Wilfred McClay has perceived, like our ancestors, humans in contemporary societies are still driven by a deep-seated need to feel morally justified. 
lacking a theological framework or ritual prescription for expunging our guilt, however, we who are mired in social just injustices quickly resort to the role of victim. The claim of victim status functions psychologically to free us of responsibility, but it leaves a wake of scapegoating, shaming, and polarization. I mentioned the place argument not to minimize the weight of privilege, nor to neutralize the legacy of, of oppression that renders some people the victims of others' evil acts. Nor do I intend to suggest that all sins are proportionate to each other, or that all people are equally culpable. Rather, I note the psychological temptation to absolve ourselves from blame and to categorize others as all evil or all good. The twin practices of lament and repentance stop us in our tracks of deflecting blame and demonizing others. By bringing our pain and our sin to God, we are able to hold ourselves and others to account without resorting to shaming tactics. We are able to give and receive forgiveness without embracing a cheap grace or glossing over the depth of wrongdoing. We are able to hope for a better future without that future either being solely dependent on us or completely outside of our control. A central task of repentance and lamentation is to admit what has happened in history. While historical narratives are always subject to interpretation, prevailing versions of American history tend to inexcusably admit or distort our nation's documented history of widespread racial oppression. Our national history, as well as the specific history of American Christianity, is tainted by a host of sins. In an effort to deny or conceal these sins, we are tempted to frame our histories in ways that are not truthful. Infected wounds that are treated, however, don't go away. They fester. It is only by squarely facing our compromised legacies that we can heal and move forward. Acknowledging what our forebears got wrong does not free us of association, enabling us to place our faith in our own righteousness in contrast to their waywardness, nor does it paralyze us from moving forward or embracing resources in our tradition. We repudiate what is abhorrent in our tradition without repudiating the tradition itself. And we name sin as sin without condemnation. When we tell the truth about history, we are empowered to set a different course for the future. I looked up as a powerful example of this work efforts to shed light on the history of lynching in the American South. Many of these efforts have been instigated by the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, which was founded by public interest lawyer Brian Stevenson in 1989. The Equal Justice Initiative has documented more than 4,400 4, lynchings of black people in the United States between 1877 and 1950. As the Equal Justice Initiative's report Lynchings in America explains, lynchings were violent and public acts of torture that traumatized black people throughout the country and were largely tolerated by state and federal officials. These lynchings were terrorism. The report goes on to describe how lynchings profoundly impacted race relations and African-American well-being, fueling the mass migration of millions of black people from the South to the North, creating a fearful environment conducive to subordination and segregation, and reinforcing a legacy of racial inequality. As part of its work to reckon with the inheritance of lynching, the Equal Justice Initiative conceived of a National Memorial for Peace and Justice which is set to open next week in Montgomery. The National Memorial, pictured above, is, will become the nation's first memorial dedicated to the legacy of black people terrorized by lynching and other expressions of state-sponsored violence. The site includes 800 six-foot hanging monuments with the names of victims of lynching inscribed on the hanging monuments representing the 800 counties across the nation where lynchings took place. An identical, identical copy of each of the 800 monuments has been placed on the grounds of the memorial where the monuments await being claimed by the counties they represent. Each of the 800 counties are invited to take their monument and erect it in a public place in their own county, telling the truth about lynching not just in Montgomery, 
but all over the country. Here in Memphis, the Lynching Sites Project is engaged in the holy work of telling the truth about the history of lynching on a local level. Instigated by area clergy and in response to the Equal Justice Initiative's call to memorialize the victims of lynching on a local level, the Lynching Sites Project was founded in 2015 to shine a light on concealed features of Shelby County's history of racial oppression. The Lynching Sites Project is engaged in the work of identifying victims of lynchings in Shelby County, placing a memorial at each lynching site, making records of local lynchings available to the public, sponsoring educational events, and hosting interfaith prayer services. Like the Equal Justice Initiative, which was inspired by Brian Stevenson's Christian faith, the Lynching Sites Project is a deeply prayerful enterprise. Led by an interfaith and interracial team, the Lynching Sites Project brings black, white, and brown people together to address social wounds and pursue healing. The Lynching Sites Project create a poignant opportunity for lamentation and repentance. In pursuit of the well-being of all, especially those who bear the legacy of injustice, the project points to the Basileia of God. Various members of the Memphis Theological Seminary community are engaged in this holy work. The practices of lamentation and repentance will not make social ills or divisions disappear, but without lamentation or repentance, our social ills and divisions will only fester. Lamentation and repentance give us the clarity to face the past and the present with our eyes open. They give us the strength to divest ourselves, even if imperfectly and incompletely, from harmful behaviors and systems. They give us the courage, even if implicitly, to act differently. Lamentation and repentance set the stage for social healing by enabling us to mourn and repudiate evil and to hope for justice. A second area I set before us today, practice and pursuit of healing for a bitterly divided society, helps take lamentation and repentance further into the realm of action. This is the practice of offering hospitality in the way of Jesus. A hospitality modeled by Jesus, illustrating the Basileia of God, is a radical welcome of the other that pushes social boundaries. In dining with tax collectors, touching the skin of lepers, discussing theology with women, visiting the home of foreigners, welcoming a motley crew of sinners into his inner circles, Jesus broke open reified divisions in society and recognized great value in people society taught him to fear and loathe. Hospitality in the way of Jesus acknowledges in the stranger a common humanity, in the poor a priceless gift, and in those rejected by society the face of God. Hospitality in the way of Jesus is a corollary to repentance in that it enables us to be present to those who have been marginalized by evils that we have perpetuated or allowed. Theologian Jennifer McBride argues that the path of discipleship calls privileged Christians to reduce the distance between themselves and victims of injustice by placing their bodies in spaces of social struggle and by standing in solidarity with those whom society condemns. Hospitality in the way of Jesus starts with a recognition of God's hospitality to each of us. Prone to feeling lost and alienated as we wander through life, we are given a place of belonging and welcome in the life of God. When we graciously welcome alienated people into spaces that we perceive as belonging to us, we mirror God's generosity. Hospitality in the way of Jesus sees other people, especially those whom society has treated with suspicion or hostility, the image of God and the imprint of Christ. As Jesus famously declared, just as you did to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did to me. Hospitality in the way of Jesus entails not just offering a gift to others, but also receiving what others have to offer. Hospitality is not one-sided charity, but rather a reciprocal exchange. As theologian Anna Maria Pineda writes, when it is most fully realized, hospitality not only welcomes strangers, it also recognizes their holiness. 
self-serving bias and in-group bias are common patterns identified by social scientists which describe how people tend to perceive themselves and their in-group in a more favorable light than others, particularly members of outgroups. Hospitality in the way of Jesus challenges this tendency by familiarizing strangers. Although exposure to difference in and of itself does not erase bias, intentionally cultivating relationships across divides helps us understand and appreciate people who are different from us in a fuller way. As Greg Ellison argues, one of the most painful dimensions of social marginalization is a perceived sense of invisibility. When people are not seen and heard by others, they often question their sense of worth, struggle with the meaning of their existence, and experience a loss of control. Hospitality in the way of Jesus, by treating marginalized people as guests of honor, speaks to the plague of invisibility. This practice acknowledges in marginalized people not just needs and wounds, but also gifts and passions. It respects the freedom and agency of all people, issuing condescension and genuinely inviting their participation and leadership. Hospitality in the way of Jesus is a practice with potential for creating social capital across a variety of social and ideological divisions. As I mentioned in last night's lecture, the political and cultural climate of contemporary American society has become so polarized that 80% of both Republicans and Democrats have unfavorable views of the other party, and nearly half of Americans say they disagree not just with their opponent's political views, but with their values and goals as well. Ariel Russell Hostile introduces the term empathy wall to describe how many Americans are unwilling to put themselves in the shoes of people in another social group. As a sociologist trying to understand the perspective of white conservatives in Alabama, Hostile concluded that many of the people she interviewed perceived people of color who benefited from government programs to be line cutters. Conversely, they perceived the government to be facilitating line cutting and thus expressed disdain for both the line cutters and the line. This rush toward victimhood status at the expense of experiencing empathy toward others is unfortunately common. As an article published in a March 2017 issue of the Journal of European Social Psychology found, that, found evidence that concerns over the societal recognition of, co of collective victimhood can be associated with intergroup animosity. In some contexts, the authors argue, competition over victimhood recognition can be the main or even the sole source of intergroup tension. The practice of hospitality in the way of Jesus, while surely no blended fix, helps promote social healing by creating spaces in which people can tell their stories and develop empathy for other people. People who suffer need their experiences to be acknowledged and respected. But people who suffer also need to recognize that other people suffer too. There are no winners in what is sometimes called the oppression Olympics. Developing empathy for others requires a willingness not just to share our own stories, but a willingness to hear and trust the stories of others. Social scientists call this, this practice perspective taking. The practice of perspective taking should not be confused with minimizing justice, minimizing injustice or excusing oppression. Rather, perspective taking acknowledges and laments the pervasiveness of harm. Perspective taking allows us to recognize and mourn a shared experience of suffering in, in others, even those who are different from us in significant ways. The friendship between Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel is a striking example of this sort of hospitality. Even though each of these leaders represented social groups who experienced an intense amount of harm, both King and Heschel were able to enter into the depths of each other's suffering, seeing African Americans and Jews in solidarity with each other. Extending the sense of solidarity and suffering to Muslims as well, Heschel invoked Midrash in his commentary on the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael, 
to imagine a meeting between Isaac and Ishmael after Abraham had died, and both Isaac and Ishmael had grown to adulthood. Heschel supposes that Isaac and Ishmael could share a bond of having felt betrayed by their father. Ishmael having been sent away into the desert, and Isaac having been offered as a sacrifice. As Heschel knew, humans are able to embrace only when they find common ground and share experiences. In his fascinating study of American political discourse, The Righteous Mind, Jonathan Haidt argues that people are fundamentally intuitive rather than rational. Americans don't reason their way to political views, but rather use reason to justify their moral intuitions. Moving past political and cultural stalemate requires Americans to develop sympathetic relationships across differences, seeing each other as bound in a common fate. Recognizing the universality of suffering and the common dimension of our humanity does not mean sanctioning unjust power relations. The practice of hospitality in the way of Jesus recognizes God's intention for all people in, is the freedom to flourish, not the right to use their agency to control others. Hospitality treats strangers with generosity, not gives strangers license to harm others. Nor is hospitality an outlet to assuage the guilt of privilege. When privileged people truly give and receive friendship across social divides, our own comfort is challenged rather than reinforced. The word hospitality conjures up images of domestic spaces, particularly the dining room table. As we explore the Christian practice of hospitality, we can appreciate the importance of the household image in both a metaphorical and a literal sense. Ephesians describes the church as members of the household of God, while God's household is ultimately the entire cosmos, it is helpful to think of the church as a manifestation of God's household. As a household of God, the church is called to embody a different kind of economics than what is evident around the world. Envisioning God as a divine economist, Eliezer Fernandez argues that as life giver, sustainer, and savior, God the economist promotes flourishing for all rather than competition for resources. The church is also embodied invited to embody this type of economy. The table is the proverbial center of many households. Certainly the table is a powerful metaphor in Jesus' depiction of the Basileia of God. In the economy that Jesus proclaimed, the destitute, hungry, sick, scorned, and abandoned are never sent away empty-handed, nor are they given containers of leftovers at the back door. Rather, they are invited to a feast at the banquet table as honored guests. In Jesus' parable, the banquet table is an expression of radical hospitality. Ali Azar Fernandez, invoking this metaphor, asks us to reconsider our table manners. Our table manners must ensure that all have access to the table and that all receive their fair share. The metaphorical table should be round, with food at the center, in reach of all who are gathered. Pointing to the image of a fiesta in his home country, the Philippines, Fernandez envisions a grand feast in which the food is delicious and plentiful, and joy, friendship, and sharing are abundant. The table also performs a powerful function in the Eucharistic meal set in motion by Jesus' Last Supper. The broken bread and poured out wine of the Last Supper point to Jesus' self-giving hospitality that extended to his very body. Assuming the form of a servant, emptying himself of ego, and taking on the pain of others, even to the point of death, Jesus illustrated with his life his economy of care and solidarity. The Eucharistic meal points to the brokenness of society, but it also points to the broken body of Jesus, shattered open for the healing and liberation of all. In the Episcopal Church, of many traditions, the Eucharistic rite acknowledges that all who gather form one body. After the sending of the Eucharistic visitors, who share communion with those who are too sick to be in church, the people gathered in worship proclaim, we who are many are one body because we all share one bread, one cup. The literal sharing of the communion cup is a reminder of everything we share as human beings, created out of the same stuff, endowed with the same dignity, inhabiting the same planet. Ritualizing the Eucharist, the communion table is where members of the household are served and nourished. 
the Eucharistic table is egalitarian. All are welcome, and those who are marginalized are given a special place. C.S. Song renames the Last Supper the People's Supper, prepared by the community for the benefit of the community. This common table, cosmic in scope, is the center of the household of God. Gathering around a common table with people representing social groups or worldviews different from our own is increasingly rare in our society. Churches, schools, neighborhoods remain segregated by race and class, with racial segregation intensifying in many communities. Social and ideological stratification has only sharpened in the Trump era. Wealth is more concentrated than ever before. Fewer people are engaging in significant relationships across political divides. Following the election of Donald Trump, the New York Times reported a decrease in the number of a million number of Americans willing to spend the holidays with their relatives of different political persuasions. Even the Thanksgiving table, with its iconic turkey dressing and pumpkin pie, is contested territory. There are good reasons to disagree with many of our fellow Americans. The call to hospitality is not a call to condone malicious behavior or foolish ideas, but it is a call to acknowledge common humanity. Jesus dined with tax collectors and with insurrectionists without endorsing either path. Jesus knew that the struggle for injustice, righteousness, and peace is ultimately not a struggle against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities of evil. The Christian practice of receiving communion in its acknowledgement that we who are many form one body is a subversive act in American society. This is especially the case when our communion tables truly welcome all people, and when those gathered around the table actually reflect some of the social diversity in the human family. The communion table should not just be a symbol of solidarity across differences, but a tangible expression of that solidarity. Dining across difference is a Christian practice that carries the ethos of the communion table. I've witnessed this practice here in Memphis, in the waiting room, Methodist Hospital, hospital on the soccer field post-game at the Croc Center, in the foyer of Temple Israel prior to a Shabbat service, and on around the vending machines in the student lounge at MTS. The opportunities to see and be seen, to hear and be heard, especially over a snack or meal, reduce the distance between us. No matter who we are, we all eat to live. Sharing food is a recognition of our common creatureliness. Christian ministries engaging in marginalization and engaging in ministry to marginalized populations often use the word hospitality to describe their work. Too often, these ministries fail to foster a mutual exchange of gifts, and thus are not offering hospitality in the way of Jesus. They create clear, clear lines between those serving and being served, those giving and those receiving, hierarchies that reinforce unjust social relations rather than challenging them. Offering hospitality to marginalized people is a practice that requires not just generosity, but also vulnerability among privileged, privileged people. We cannot give meaningfully unless we are also willing to receive. And we cannot have compassion for others in their brokenness unless we are also willing to admit our own brokenness. Father Gregory Boyle, a Jesuit priest and founder of Homeboy Industries, recognizes hospitality as an exercise in mutuality. Homeboy Industries is a social enterprise which seeks to provide hope, training, and support to formerly gang-involved men and women in Los Angeles. Homeboy Industries trains and employs hundreds of previously incarcerated people, providing opportunities not just for work, but also for leadership. Homeboy Industries seeks to create what Boyle calls a community of tenderness, in which God's unconditional love for even the most flawed human beings is mirrored by how members of the community treat themselves and each other. We go to the margin, says Boyle, not to save or rescue people, but to foster kinship. Every moment is an opportunity 
to recognize our interconnectedness, says Boyle, who maintains that radical inclusion is possible only when we see others as God sees them, and when we trade in our own self-righteousness for the capacity to experience our own pain. The ultimate measure of health in any community might well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what folks have to carry rather than in judgment of how they carry it, says Boyle. In a political climate like ours that capitalizes on fear and disdain for others, this type of hospitality is a cool drink of water. It replaces distrust with curiosity and animosity with tenderness. Ours is a highly fractured society, both socially and ideologically. The practices I have explored in this morning's lecture are not a panacea for our society's divisions and injustices, nor are they a substitute for political engagement. But in a climate in which foreigners are distrusted, people of color are criminalized, special interest groups are elevated, the poor are rendered invisible, and those sitting across the political aisle are condemned, Practices of lament, repentance, and hospitality offer faithful alternatives to these disturbing patterns. These practices encourage us to put down our weapons of war and look each other in the eye. They reveal our strategies of drugging ourselves with nostalgia, bullying others with the Bible, taking refuge in our tribalism, and basing our successes on other people's losses to be hollow and immature. And they point us to the beauty of God's reign of love and justice, of which there is plenty to go around. <laughs>